I'll be back in a minute. I just need to do something. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> So welcome if you've just joined us. Um, there's about 20 odd people on online. We'll just wait a couple more minutes while people um, join and then we'll make a start. It's only just three. So we're fine. Okay, we might make a start. Um, welcome everybody to the first uh, seminar of 2021. Um, if you haven't joined us before, this is these seminars are run by the Living with Disability Research Centre at La Trobe University in Melbourne. Um, and we've been running them ever since last March uh, online with a fairly mixed audience of people. Um, and lots of people have also requested that we start to record them and make them available to people that aren't able to join us in real time. And I'm hoping that's okay with our presenters today. Um, we've got two amazing presentations today, which, which came together really fortuitously. Um, and they're focused on, on really the role of the case manager or the support coordinator, or in the case of the UK, the named social worker. So somebody that coordinates and supports the person with intellectual disability to, to, to be a good consumer really, and to exercise choice and control um, over this new uh, system that we've developed both in the UK and in Australia that's supposed to enable people to exercise choice and control. The question is, how do they do that? And here are two uh, sets of research which try to start to unpack some of those issues around coordinating support, supporting choice and control, managing one's own services and so on. 
So our first present, our first presenter is Lynn Romeo, who we are incredibly lucky to have. Um, Lynn has been a social worker for over 40 years um, as a frontline practitioner and then uh, in supervisory and leadership roles in the UK. She was appointed as the first chief social worker in England in 2013 and that's the sort of position that we certainly don't have in Australia. Some of us might wish we would have something like that. Um, she came actually to Australia about this time last year, maybe a little bit before, um, and we made contact with her and she was going to uh, present for us. Since that time, there's been a lot of things happening and uh, I think she's stayed maybe longer than she intended, um, but she's probably better off in Australia than she has been in the UK at the moment. <laughs> so you might not be in a hurry to go back. Um, but when Lynn was the chief social worker, she initiated an amazing project uh, called the Named Social Worker. And today she's going to talk about the rationale for that project, how it worked, and some of the evaluations of it. Uh, we should just flag that in the UK, people use learning disabilities to refer to people with, what we call people with intellectual disabilities. So when she uses that term, she's referring to people with intellectual disabilities rather than the way we use that term here, which is about often people who have just specific learning difficulties such as um, oh, not being able to spell. I can't remember the right name. Dyslexia. For that. Dyslexia, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Probably me. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Lynn, who's going to talk for um, half an hour or so, and then there will be room for questions. If you want to ask questions during the talk, you can put them in the mm -hmm. Q&A box, and I'll just keep an eye on that, and if we need to interrupt her, we will, but uh, otherwise she'll just keep talking until she's finished, and then we'll take questions and she'll try and answer them. So over to you, Lynn. Great, and thanks for inviting me to do this. And I'm probably a bit rusty, not having done anything like this for a while, but bear with me. Um, so yeah, so the name social worker, we called it that just, it's really allocated or somebody who has responsibility who would be the lead person. Um, uh, so we called it name social worker for want of a better term. And it was, our, our hypothesis was that we were wanting to try and contribute to reversing the problems of poor and restrictive outcomes for a lot of people. And to improve, actually improve the social work practice and confidence and satisfaction. And also to have an impact on the wider system benefits of taking a more preventative, integrated and longer term approach to supporting people around their health and social care needs. Um, and very specifically, I suppose it was that the person and their families would have more control over decisions about their future, that they would be supported to live with the dignity and independence for which we were all striving. And there was a particular um, focus on human rights and social justice being at the core of practice. And then uh, a program about trying to do something different, piloting new ideas and generating early and indicative evidence. Uh, because we'd been very trapped in this care management model that had uh, developed in the 90s and really had been brought over from uh, some of the American approach and people had become very processy around their approach to working with people. So whilst it, say, it says it was the Department of Health Initiative, it actually came from this new office that had been created around the Chief Social Worker and us wanting to position social work and the social model uh, much more at the heart of working with people. Uh, okay, next slide. <laughs> oh, hang on, Dick. Sorry, should be right. doing some social work. Okay. Uh, so phase one, okay, move on to the next slide. Uh, we put out a call for people who are interested. Uh, we selected from those that call out these six local authorities. And just to explain, in England, uh, social care or social services is the responsibility of local authorities, councils. They usually cover about 200 to 300,000 people, population. Uh, so these six areas were selected. Um, you can see on the map where they are. And they all uh, develop their own particular model and approach, uh, depending on their local context. So in Calderdale, they were very, very keen to look at this relationship-based work where power and control meaningfully shifted to the individual. 
and uh, really putting human rights at the heart of everything that social workers are doing. So a real focus on the human rights of the individual, uh, the support of their family uh, in order to thrive. In Camden, which is a London borough, they uh, developed from the um, independent reviewing officer role they had in children's social care, this idea of someone who would oversee all of the individuals and what was being done with them by the social worker and the other people in the system to quality assure and to challenge if things weren't really uh, putting the person at the heart of what was going on and that there wasn't best practice. Hertfordshire, they were trying to improve the knowledge and skills and uh, expertise of the people working with people with disabilities and their families. Uh, so really investing in skills and practice and evidence development uh, to try and have a very robust, robust platform of the future. In Liverpool, they really wanted to look at the, they had an incredible number of people still uh, living in what they call assessment and treatment units, which are essentially NHS psychiatric units where people have been living for quite a long periods of time and there was a lot of risk aversion to supporting them to move out of those uh, units. So this was about looking at really working with those in, inpatients, um, experimenting and looking at best practice to help colleagues feel less risk averse, to work across agencies and to help support people back into a more community-based setting. Nottingham were looking at the causes of why people were being admitted and what prevention they could do before that. Uh, and Sheffield was trying to look at much more better uh, multidisciplinary working and optimizing uh, the systems available to people uh, to help them to move into better arrangements. So it was really about questioning what had become very well embedded formal processes. Uh, thanks. Next slide. So as is often the case with these government programs, I managed to secure a certain amount of funding by the time you put your call out, by the time people do what they have to do, time gets on and they have shorter and shorter periods to actually do what they were going to do. So it's quite a very com compacted period of time. But even though it was like that, we started to get examples and evidence uh, of good practice and the impact it was having. So certainly a much better focus on discharging or proactive work to discharge people out of hospital units. And previously for a lot of people, this hadn't even been on the agenda. I think that they were probably going to stay there for years on end if, if we hadn't had this focus. Uh, much more evidence of the individuals having much more choice and control over where they will live and uh, living independently. And there was something about really engaging with what mattered to the person, what strengths and gifts they had and how that could be utilized to support them to uh, aspire to what they wanted to do individuals reporting that they feel much, they felt much more supported and that that stronger relationship approach with the person had built trust and they, that consistency made a real difference uh, and they were but just generally people were much more involved in their care and support planning and um, involved in decision making so the other things were so positive changes in the system were improved coordination increased visibility of the social model within the multidisciplinary teams. There'd been a much heavier emphasis on care and treatment type approaches, that the social workers were building more practical knowledge and experience, particularly around some of the legislative frameworks within which they had to work uh, over there. The three main ones, though, are Mental Capacity Act, Care Act, and the uh, European Convention on Human Rights, that the professionals were developing their confidence to be much more proactively advocating for their individual the person that they were working with within the multidisciplinary settings. Often they felt they were deferring to the psychiatrist or the psychologist or people who were seen as higher up the kind of professional ladder, if you like. So giving them that confidence and then sharing that knowledge and reflecting on that knowledge across social work teams, but across the country as well, and then starting to embed new processes into that, uh, from that learning, such as better consent forms, having transforming care and discharging people out of restrictive environments early on, and using assessment checklists. Uh, thanks. Next slide. Uh, then we then had money for phase two. Uh, so what we found is that some local authorities carried on in phase two, some dropped out and new ones came. The focus in phase two was trying to drill down into what was the actual difference in terms of what social workers did in terms of their practice. How could we gather the evidence about what good social work looked like so we could promote and build on that. So uh, doing good social work, being ambitious about what that meant, 
absolutely committed to that being co-produced with people with intellectual disabilities, doing that with the social workers in terms of designing and delivering and evaluating and learning. So trying to learn together on behalf of the wider system and then having some evidence base, because if we were going to try and promote this model, which meant more money going to local authorities to have more social workers, we'd have to have some evidence of impact. Thank you. That just gives you an idea of how they developed. Uh, we, we had two, um, two, two uh, units supporting the local authorities. The innovation unit, which is known for doing more innovative design type principles in helping people think about better models of service delivery and the Social Care Institute for Excellence who were gathering the evidence. So they went on site, uh, they worked alongside supporting each of the local authorities where they designed and developed their model, did a lot of coaching and visiting and support and then helped them do their evaluation. And then between sites, lots of workshops and uh, reflection uh, and then uh, distributing this information more widely through wider sector engagement. Thank you. Next slide. So these were the sites that were in the phase two, some from the first phase and new ones. Uh, the people who'd worked in Calderdale had actually got new jobs in uh, Bradford, so they decided to take that model there and uh, build on it there, but also use it to develop a competency framework for advanced practitioners who would be the lead practitioners, if you like, working with this particular cohort of clients. Um, Liverpool moved from their inpatient unit to start to work with young people moving into adulthood to try and ensure that those young people in transition from children's services moving into adult services would uh, move into more community-based uh, placements. A lot of them were, had traditionally been placed out of the area. Uh, Holton again also wanted to work with young people moving into adulthood because this was often one of the key areas that was found a lot of young people moving from children's services often ended up in very expensive placements out of area and often then stayed there for very long periods of time. So it was trying to address uh, getting hold of pe young people and moving them into more independent settings early on. Hertfordshire were continuing to use their uh, key social workers as a linchpin, the connector between the individual and other professionals and using a lot more support, peer support between professionals to have a kind of proactive uh, risk enabling approach. Uh, Sheffield were again also working with young people in transition to have future options and, and built a whole team around this model to try and support families uh, and the young person to move into uh, stable placements rather than responding only to crises. And Shropshire worked with a particular cohort of schools who uh, provided special education again to try and get that transition right. Thank you. So the evaluation and learning. Uh, the evaluation approach, because it wasn't a longitudinal study and everybody was using a different model, you couldn't really do this kind of random control trial comparison type stuff. So the approach that they took was this theory-based approach to evaluation that was seen to be robust and realistic given the time. So there was an in interplay between the program and what was happening that worked at the framework that gave you data for the program evaluation, but was also flexible enough to draw out what was happening in each individual site. A lot of hand-holding went on from the support units. The social workers were not researchers. They didn't have a strong a skill base in uh, project and research evaluation. So a lot of this came from the innovation unit and the um, Sky Institute. Uh, and the diagram kind of gives you, runs through how they did that. So I won't go into detail. You can kind of have a look at that at your leisure. So next slide. Uh, so this, this sort of gives you an overall kind of framework of what were the enablers, what were the components uh, for the name social worker sites, what the outcomes were, uh, both the, the individuals and their families, the social workers and then the system, and then the impact that had in terms of uh, the people, social workers and the system itself. So again, I won't go, I won't uh, dig down into that because um, I'm conscious of the time, but if we move on to the evaluation findings that kind of highlights that. So in terms of um, people who were actually using social work services or involved in the services, the main thing that they report back through the surveys and through the qualitative interviews was that they felt they, they had, there was a much more trusted relationship between the social worker and themselves and their families, that they, 
had much higher levels of satisfaction with the support they were receiving. Uh, through the social worker, the social workers were keeping reflective logs and individual stories to show how uh, people were, had been impacted upon. I've left that bit off actually, but the main thing was that they had evidence that people were much more involved in their care and support planning and felt much more involved in decisions about what was going to happen next. And then evidence of smoother discharges from the hospital units and also where placements were a bit shaky or starting to break down that that input had helped create greater stability of placements. For social workers themselves, they reported much higher level of skill and knowledge and confidence, particularly around the opportunity to develop their communication skills, uh, a much deeper understanding of intellectual disabilities, autism and mental health needs than they'd previously had, which helped them to work more confidently with people. And they were much more satisfied with the, the quality of work that they were able to have able to do they felt more equipped they were given permission to do the work so they felt um, that time to do it well really helped them feel much better about what they were doing and in terms of the wider system there was real evidence around actually reduced costs for some of the packages of the care that were being provided so an example might be uh, sometimes people who were seen to have challenging behavior were given a lot of kind of input with care support staff often at very high ratios, but actually once they'd started to develop this different way of working with people and once people understood about uh, risk and how to manage it more appropriately, that level of support could be reduced and uh, people were much more confident about supporting somebody. Better cross uh, service coordination as well and also it started to complement bigger strategic de developments such as the big transforming care program across the NHS and social care, where the kind of 5,000 people that were in restricted hospital units uh, were being informed by this social model and um, relational approach to working with the individual. Thank you. These are just some of the quotes, the verbatim quotes from some of the people involved. So one of the parents and one of the social workers and uh, one of the health partners, I, you can see those for yourself, but it sort of enhances the uh, evaluation findings that I've just run through with you. So the core features of the, the approach. So these were common to all the sites, even though they developed slightly different models. At the heart of it was being really person-centered and asset-based. And that is the time to really get to know people, to really focus on what matters to them, rather than what's the matter with them, what actually mattered to them, finding creative ways to support people to achieve those, and having high aspirations. And I think that was a, a big kind of um, shift because often aspirations were very low for people and people had low aspirations for themselves because of the long history of how they'd been supported in the past. So having high aspirations about what was possible uh, and what mattered to people really made a big difference. The skills and confidence of the actual practitioners, giving them time to have group learning sets, reflective supervision, permission to think outside the box, the confidence that that giving them that responsibility uh, gave them and uh, that sense of accountability as well and to advocate for people within that multidisciplinary setting. Um, they came on leaps and bounds there. So better partnership working. Uh, they had a real role to play in those multidisciplinary settings, making sure the services were joined up around the person, being that trusted point of contact. One of the big complaints always was people not knowing who their person was, who to go to. They had to see the psychologist for this, the OT for that, and so on. So having somebody who held the ring on all of that story and would be the conduit for it really made a big difference. And having a more systemic approach. So ways of this becoming a mainstream way of getting feedback loops, particularly for commissioners who often sit separately and who will commission providers to provide particular types of services. And sometimes they're just not the right thing. So giving that feedback, getting that feedback loop working much more effectively, and then actually working with providers to try and shape better options for people rather than just providing the same old thing they'd be, been providing year in and year out. And looking more to the local assets within communities rather than just the statutory uh, NGO or local authority or health services. So there's often a lot of resource within 
the communities that wasn't being tapped into. Uh, so this uh, model was helping to tap into what was actually going on at the local community centre that maybe people didn't realise that people could be uh, uh, introduced to. Thank you. Next slide. So, but they do, you do have to create the right conditions for this to all work. And for social workers, that won't come as any big surprise. Protected time, having the time to do it, the time to spend with people, uh, to, the time to learn from other sites, uh, to the time to reflect and think about um, how to do things better. Uh, and we really came to the conclusion this was a wise investment rather than an unaffordable luxury because of the impact it could have. Providing the opportunity for peer learning between social workers across teams, across uh, local authorities. They've often been driven just by dealing with the volume, the high numbers of referrals, and actually having space to really work properly with people made a big difference. And that reflective supervision space, where about, which was about nurturing and reflection rather than just transactional. How many cases have you dealt with? What have you done about this? What have you done about that? Actually starting to think about really good deep reflective practice and the importance of people and their families feeding into that as well. The permission to take on this role, to be responsible, accountable, uh, to use their judgment and their status uh, to push more for the things that were seen as important in the project. Clear measures of the big thing that social work suffers from in the UK is never setting out what you're going to do, how you did it and what difference it made. So having a framework to provide that clear measure. Uh, and then a high ambition for what good social work should look like, moving away from that very process, procedurally driven approach to case management or care management, to getting back to actual uh, practice and relationship based work and putting human rights and social justice at the heart of what they did. And very importantly, that co-production or that co-design, co-development with people and their families to uh, develop what good social work should be. And of course, what's come out of that is this very much about, it's the relationship, it's the professional use of self, it's the holding the story and being alongside people that makes the most difference, not necessarily throwing loads of resources at uh, support work or expensive placements and so on. So um, I think, is there one more slide? I can't see myself. Oh yeah, so these are some of the quotes again from people. Uh, the social worker, um, social workers talking about the difference it made to them in particular about being part of this project. Next slide. So the thing that this helped us do as well was develop a kind of kind of skills uh, inventory, if you like, of what we needed named social workers to be like. They won't be any, they're not surprising, that's what social workers should be like anyway. Empathic, problem solving, that they're patient, team player and so on. So this is now starting to inform the job profiles for lead practitioners in these areas. Uh, next slide. What gets in the way? What are the obstacles? Um, too many cases, not enough time. This pressure to close cases, uh, not keep in touch with people, all the bureaucracy and paperwork. One of the key things around better communication skills, not enough time is being spent on uh, social work qualification courses or post qualification courses around really good communication skills uh, with people. The culture clash between services that's a real issue in the UK where you have health, the NHS run separately from social care, social work. Often, then, um, services are overshadowed by very medicalized, restrictive approaches rather than the social model. Responding to crises, not kind of preventative approach. Um, and it gave a chance to legitimize that actually the social model and social work had something to offer. And the big area was this transition period where you do now, there used to be a kind of generic family social work service. Now it's been very much divided into children's and family work. And there's been a real gap and a division between those two areas. So trying to get that transition working better, culture change, taking time for that culture change because it can take a long time. And keeping up the quality interactions when competing pressures uh, make a real issue. And I think, um, I think the kind of COVID impact has probably set this back quite a way because of the issues around that um, really putting pressure on people at the moment. 
Next slide. Uh, and what helps when it happens? You've got to have your senior management behind you, allowing you to take those roles and uh, to support people who might make unwise decisions that are not necessarily um, uh, unsafe to be decisions, but unwise decisions. Time for peer learning, ensuring you've got a diverse background within your team so that everybody's not looking at everything through the same lens. Enough lower caseloads. Uh, the freedom to have, to take responsibility and to use budgets creatively, involvement with younger people earlier, more preventative work, stopping the escalation into crisis, more co-location working together, trying to integrate the budgets where you can, and that link with communities and local service offers and neighbourhoods. Thank you. Next slide. <clears throat> so then beyond that is the kind of changing culture, that sort of alluded to this early, uh, this closing the loop with commissioning, who actually goes out there and commissions providers and kind of sets up the options that are available, getting that more informed by people and uh, the practitioners working alongside people, working with providers to help them shape a different offer as well. The importance of that social model, that social perspective in thinking about integrated and place-based uh, support tapping into local resources and trying to drive that culture change across the teams, but also across the wider system. And I think that might be it. Yes, and that's it. I don't know if I've stuck to my time. I hope I have. Oh. Uh, so any questions? Well done, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, there's a couple of, of questions, but can I just ask one first? Is there, you, you mentioned about the things that help and the things that hinder and obviously time, caseloads and longevity are issues. So uh, uh, how are they resolved? Is there a, an open-ended commitment uh, to having a named social worker that's something that doesn't have an end date? And what would be the standard sort of caseloads in an ideal situation? Yes, I think that was what we were trying to move into, that yes, what actually works is where somebody has their name social worker and they continue having their name social worker for as long as possible. So um, we'd had evidence previously, prior to the introduction of the case management model, uh, people did have social workers for years, essentially. Their social worker was there with them through their journey. Uh, but there'd been a real kind of, oh, a kind of a commodification, industrialization, if you like, of social work and case management. So it was getting back to there's enough evidence of the payback, if you like, in terms of better outcomes, stability, uh, improved um, living arrangements for people to keep that model, to return to that model that with a bit more kind of efficiency and effectiveness around it. So I think in most uh, local authorities where they've piloted it, they have, they have recognised they need that investment to give, to have enough staff to be able to do that and to do it over a long, long time. So it is a long-term model with manageable caseloads that and it demonstrates it is, benefits. Yes, yes. I think, well, I, I'm saying that's where I left it. I'm sure when I get back, it might not be like that, but that was, that was uh, the evidence was pointing in that direction. Yeah. Thank you. So um, Coral, who's, uh, who's a support coordinator and also is one of our students, it says, are the clients able to choose who their name social worker was? Um, that's a good question. They, they weren't able to choose because it was, it was each local authority would recruit to those posts and then those people would be the name social worker. So they had to choose from that group of people. But usually they, the people who were in that cohort were people who had a real rapport with people with intellectual dis disabilities or autism or mental health needs. And mostly they were quite happy with their social workers, but if they weren't, they were able to choose somebody else. Do you want to talk a bit about how difficult sometimes making a choice is if you don't know what you're, who you're choosing or, you know, uh, I think we use, in Australia, we use the term choice and control very, you know, a lot. We throw it around and we say, oh yes, you can choose your support coordinator, but we don't enable people to, to suss out what the different options might be? Um, mm. Mostly, I think it's through the way it would 
work there is, say I'm, I'm Lynn, I'm going to be your social worker and we're going to work together and spend time uh, introducing myself, talking it through, exploring things, getting to know each other. And if, if at the end of the day, the person said, I just don't feel right with you, I don't feel this is going to work, then there'd be a decision to ask somebody else to come and introduce themselves and talk about how they might work. So, so through that, through the relational lens, if you like. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a there's a question from Alex Chung, who's also, I think, a PhD student in social work. Um, I, I think the nub of what she's saying is that the new CRPD is clearly about decision making being based on people's will and preferences um, and then so how do you how do you respect people's preferences not to uh, engage in forms of intervention not to be part of the service system particularly I think people with psychosocial disabilities who may be in some form of, of compulsory treatment or even people with intellectual disabilities who are in settings where they're not don't want to be so how do you manage that within this system um well i suppose the the chief kind of um framework legislative framework is what's known as the mental capacity act there i don't know if you have a similar thing it's very different in the uk from us we yeah. don't, don't have that same okay so that that's been around for quite a while now and, and the kind of core of it is that um, people can make unwise decisions, uh, but you have a whole series of tests in order to see whether if they're given information that they can weigh up that information, they can retain the information while making a decision about which option they want to choose, that they cho that they're choosing not to have treatment or not to have particular intervention, and they've been able to hold on to that information and weigh it up and understand the consequences of it, that you would accept they had the capacity to make that decision albeit seen as unwise by everybody else. So that, that, that's the legislative framework to allow people to make those sorts of decisions. Clearly when somebody is uh, dangerously unwell or psychotic or whatever, then there's, another there's that legislation and the Mental Health Act, which says if they are a danger to themselves or somebody else, then you would go against their wishes and compuls compulsorily detain them. I think they still can't be made to have treatment, though. That's still something you can't do. I don't know if that answers the question. I, I think to some extent, I mean, mm -hmm. Australia has similar uh, provisions, but you, we don't have the Mental Capacity Act where, that, where those decisions are sort of made by professionals. You have to go to a, a, a seek guardianship more formally mm -hmm. if, you, if you're going to make a decision on behalf of somebody else. Uh, although obviously there's an awful lot of informal substitute decision making that, mm. that happens as the research shows happens in the UK too. Mm. Uh, mm. um, um, Lisa O'Brien says, thanks for a great presentation. Have you published, is there a re published a report? Can people follow up this somehow? Yes, you can follow it up. If you go on to the social care for institute, um, let me just find it physically. Social Care Institute for Excellence website, you'll be able to find the report that was published by Sky and the Innovation Unit, which sets all of this out in detail. So I can I could send you the link, actually, if you want. Um, I'll send the link to David and that can be circulated. Right. Yep, and we will, we will circulate the slides as well uh, to people that have participated and we'll put the link on the end of the slides, I think. Um, Karen Begley, who's a, a social worker um, academic, says, given the commodification and industrialization context behind the shift to less effective pr uh, approaches uh, to social work, uh, did you specifically look at the economic implications and arguments of the model? Um, she says she missed the first five minutes, but maybe talk a little bit more. I think you did say you found it to be cost effective as a, you know, investment. Yes. They did, they actually, they also uh, brought in a, a, your consulting, which did a predictive financial return on investment analysis. Uh, and although it was a short time, time frame, there were st strong indications of the impact that the approach had. 
Um, so I think they found, let me just get to my notes, they, they found that through the better coordination and more intensive support offer and the improved outcomes, there was a reduction in the cost of a number of care packages and the predictive financial return on investment analysis showed an average of about five pounds could be saved for each pound invested. Wow. But even though we had that, we were often challenged about it because of the, what was seen as a very short time scale for the, you know, it was only over a year really, a year to 18 months. So we would have had to go on for a lot, lot longer, I think, to really consolidate uh, that return on investment finding. Um, so so anybody, I'm hoping, pardon? go on, sorry. I was gonna say, has anybody continued it? Is, is it continuing anywhere to gather that data? It's, it's, it's only continuing with, within each site because the department no longer, you know, carried on funding the pilots, if you like. So it was left then to local authorities to pick up the learning and develop that model, to continue the development of their models within their local authorities. So um, Daniel Layton, who's the uh, intellectual disability advisor to the NDIS, uh, says, what connection does the named social worker have to individual budgets? And has there been an opportunity to compare regions where the name social worker does or doesn't have direct access to flexible funding and if so what are the pros and cons of each approach just for your background in australia we now have a system where an individual is through a planning process or maybe a assessment process as well to come uh, they're allocated an individual budget which is fairly open then for them to go and purchase a whole range of services. So we don't have commissioning as middle people, people just go and buy their own services and that can be managed by them, by their family. And often there's a support coordinator who coordinates that, but those people have very limited time and they're certainly not often as qualified as the type of social workers you talked about. So. How, do you, how does your name, social worker, stand, I guess, in relation to management of individual budgets? Yes, okay, so the system's a bit different there in that the local authority gets given all the money. Uh, they're responsible for the assessments, if you like, or the needs or the determination of what level of care needs somebody has and then allocating the budget to that particular individual and their family. Uh, it, the same thing that can happen there, they can be then given that money as a, what they call a direct payment. And so the family or the person can make their own arrangements. They can ask for support in order to explore options or to be given advice and guidance and so on. Or they can choose for the budget to be managed on their behalf by the named social worker. Uh, but they would be working very closely alongside of them. So people, I suppose, have the choice to either employ the resources of the social worker and the local authority systems to help them purchase and buy their care either through their direct payment or through the local authority being guided by them as to what what they want uh, so it's a bit different i suppose they've got many, a choice but it sounds like in, in in many cases in your study the name social worker would actually be managing somebody's budget with them yes that's right in this in this instance, they were, yeah. And so your evidence, I think, answers Daniel's question that, that there was evidence that it was more having a named social worker playing that role was actually shown to be very effective. It was, but having said that, I think there were also, there are also lots of examples of people who get what they call the direct payment, which I suppose is more akin with your individual budget being given to the person. Um, and often it's families who are taking, the role, taking on that role and doing it all. Uh, sometimes they want the support of a professional uh, to help them with that, but sometimes they don't. So it, it often depends on their experience or their confidence themselves. Um, and I, there's not really a good comparison. I, I wouldn't say we've got a robust comparator there that we could say this is better or not better. So Daniel, if you've got other follow up, then just put it in the in the Q&A and I'll follow it up. Um, Primrose, uh, who's a lecturer in OT, 
uh, says, thank you for your presentation. What were the measures that you used to evaluate the program? Were some more useful than others? Um, the measures were, and I've, I'll be really, I haven't got all of the detail with me actually, but measures were whether people were discharged from, uh, especially inpatient units that they'd been in usually for over two to five, sometimes between two to 10 years. Uh, whether there were proactive plans in place for them to be discharged, whether they were discharged and how long they had been successfully supported in a more community-based placement. And then the qualitative measures, uh, people, either people and their families reporting on their confidence, their feeling of having more choice and control, uh, social workers. For, I do have one thing here that I've managed to retrieve from my notes. Um, the, Social workers were surveyed and interviewed before the project and then after they'd been involved in it, for example, their confidence to, mean, to meaningfully engage people to deliver a more person-centered plan increased from 47% to 94%. So they were the kind of measures. When I talked about the evaluation findings, they were the things that were being measured as we went through the program. Okay. Um, are there other questions people have they want to put in the box? Um, but I, why social workers? So in Australia, the it, it, social workers don't play a large role in adult social care in the disability support service system. Um, and where they do, they're often seen as interchangeable with other professions like OTs or, you know, allied health is sort of this generic. And, mm. and social workers often don't have a particular role Whereas I think there's a different tradition in the UK that social workers do have a very clear role. But what's your reflections then on this learning about the skill base that's needed to do this type of relationship um, role, working together with people? What's, is it unique to social work from your perspective? Um, that's a good question. I think partly it was, it's historical that um, when, when social services departments were set up in the early 70s, it was about moving away from a medical NHS dominated model. So they were moved into local authorities and they, and social workers were the profession that went over into local authorities to lead on this more family community based relationship based model of working and social care is provided through local authorities. So all of your care, home support, care support workers, et cetera, et cetera, all come from that place. Uh, and over time, that role had been sort of um, diminished, I suppose, because they got into this care manager model. And so it was about reclaiming social work at the heart of that and reclaiming its place to work alongside health professionals to get a good integrated approach to health needs and social care needs. So it's more of a historical context, I think, that it's social workers that we were promoting and choosing to lead on this because they are the backbone of the local authority social care departments. We don't have, we have a few OTs, but their role is mainly around assessing for AIDS and adaptations to people's, people's property. Whereas in the health service, they're much more therapeutic. So it's more probably just the way in which roles have developed over time. And I guess uh, the thing for me was that social work had developed as a profession that was about relational working, the use of the relationship to achieve change and to support people, the use of the, uh, uh, the this, this social, this social context of this, the person within their context and their neighbourhoods and their families as the model of how you were going to work with people rather than the, what in, the, in England anyway is very dominated by diagnosis, treatment, plans, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So it's trying to move more predominantly into a more social model of disability and how you work with people. So it's just the opportunity, I suppose. And obviously I'm the chief social worker, so I want to promote social workers this is having a key role to play and they had for a long time they had led on learning disability work over there because it was located very firmly within local authorities for a long time and it's very firmly not in a medical model which mm. is what many of the allied health professionals work within still um, mm. but is there something too about the skills and the training that social workers have in their experience that lends themselves to this type of work. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, that's how they're trained to 
be talking to people, to be listening deeply, to be reflective, to be, you know, trying to work from a position of what matters to people, what their strengths are, to build on those strengths, to build on the, the family system and the community, community assets around people. That's the social justice, the whole basis around human rights. Around, and, you know, social workers are often criticised for that, being beating around the bush and being too concerned with listening and not doing. You know, in fact, an OT once said to me, I was going to be a social worker once, but I decided I wanted to do things, not just talk. <laughs> so maybe that's the difference. But I think social workers also do a lot of troubleshooting, don't they, with systems. Yes. They know how to play mm. and work out systems, which is, you know, fairly important in that type of role. Okay. Yes, and being the kind of the bridge between people and between systems and negotiating those kind of murky grey spaces. Yeah. Mm. Living with, being comfortable with uncomfortableness and uncertainty and ambiguity, that's part of what good social workers enjoy, which a lot of other people don't like. It. I can hear the social workers in the audience nodding and agreeing with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wonder, Michelle, Mich Michelle, who's going to be our next speaker, um, you're a parent. Uh, do you have any, any questions of, of, of Lynn or any comments you want to make? Amongst other things, you're a parent. I should also say you're a PhD student and a very skilled lawyer, but you know, <laughs> do you want to make some comments? I, I, I think it's been interesting because one of the things I have come across in my work is the need for this kind of role. Um, and that's something I'm gonna talk about in a minute, but, but um, to have that kind of relationship reflective problem solving support that's located within the system who can translate back and forth between what someone's needs might be and what programs might be available for example which is something that as Christine said it's not necessarily what a support coordinator does depending on of course the individual but yeah, I, I think that's something that's really needed and um, and it is something that social workers provide in other areas. Um, just coincidentally, my sister was a social worker and worked in, in um, uh, juvenile justice for many years in the government. So, it, and the work that she was doing was very much, you know, you, she was someone's social worker and she helped them with with what happened as they moved through the juvenile justice system. Did they need bail? Did they need accommodation? And that role is almost exactly the kind of thing, the gap that exists that I guess I'll be talking about in a few minutes. So yeah, it's just more evidence for the, the gap that exists at the moment in the Australian system. So, but thank you. Mm. Okay, last, last. Last chance, anybody else who wants to put a question in? Jacinta, do you have anything to add from your perspective? Are you still there? No? Yeah, I'm still here. My problem was, for some reason, I think if I'm, my Q&A is not working. But anyway. Yeah, I, I suspect the Q&A might not be working at all because it sort of stopped about 15 minutes ago, David. Um, I don't know what's happened. Anyway, yeah, I, can't, I, couldn't, I couldn't add anything um, I, in the Q&A. Look, some really important findings, and I, one of the things that I really enjoy is that you've actually chosen a sort of theoretical um, model for evaluation, um, Lynn, that I think is, is really powerful. But one of the things I wanted to ask you um, a little bit about was how you went about the co-production process in, in doing this work and the sort of um, what got in the way and what helped from that perspective? So the way we did it was when we were first going to put a call out for people who might be interested in becoming part of the program was we also, uh, there are some very robust or well-developed uh, cohorts of people who are people who use services and their families uh, through different organizations in the UK. So they, they came in uh, with us to start to design the call out 
for action and the sorts of things we wanted. So they helped design the program right from the beginning, right through to the end. So the co-production started with even just the call to action or a call to people who wanted to be involved in the program, uh, the way in which we put the call out. They helped interview all of the local authorities who were putting themselves forward to be part of the pilots. Uh, the, the, the people coming to be pilots had to come with people with intellectual disabilities and family carers uh, so that uh, it was a kind of collaborative approach across the practitioners and uh, people who were service users for want of a better term. Uh, so that, that's the way we did it. Every, every step of the way had to be together, if you like, with people, uh, with them alongside helping design and reflect and improve and challenge. Did you find any challenges in that process that, that, that come to um, the, Really, the, I mean, the main challenge is that, you know, making sure you can provide good access and support for people. So it meant a lot of investment from the department in making sure we had good communication supporters, the right equipment there. Um, that, that all takes time and money uh, and making sure we could do that. All the transport, you know, making sure all of the things that would normally be obstacles to people being able to have proper and equal access to participating were minimized as far as they could be. That was the main thing. Um, but generally speaking, um, no, I mean, there's a, there's a good tradition there, there now, I have to say, of co-producing with people and their families. So it's sort of, it's just part of the way things are done. Mm -hmm. And look, I really agree. It was, it was those issues around the practicalities that I think sometimes people forget in, in actually planning for and being ready for, and issues around... I think the example of communication, it came up as so important in your presentation in terms of doing well, you know, throughout the, the sort of program, but being ready for that, because in many ways, otherwise, the co-production is always focused on the higher level, um, if you like, service users, to use your term, rather than maximising the input of people who have... Um, more challenging needs for us to actually support, to be participatory and to actually mm. follow through on that. So I think it was just good to hear you saying that you have to take into account those practicalities. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's been a really, really great presentation and, and discussion. I, I do suspect there's something happened with the Q&A and I apologise to people. We, we might, we're going to take a very short break um, David, I just wonder if we... Well, I, look, a, a question has just come through, oh, so I'm not okay. sure if uh, there, there is a oh. problem. Okay, so, so it, there's just two more come through. So just before... I, I've just seen um, one. Oh, a, okay. Yeah, you're right, yeah. Hang on. There's an interesting question. I must just ask you this. Uh, as somebody who's a student says, thank you for your presentation. I understand that social workers usually need to cooperate with other professionals, such as OTs or physios, but do you think it belongs to the professional practice or managerial practice? Um, I think a professional practice. I think... Um Social workers are often located within multidisciplinary teams and a lot of their achievements or their satisfaction is around, and I've seen, I saw some brilliant examples when I went to visit the sites actually, of really amazing work between a nurse uh, and a social worker and how they work together on a lot of these very challenging areas where everybody else was very worried about the risk that the person might present if they were allowed to leave the hospital unit and live in a bungalow, et cetera, et cetera. So that happened at a frontline, on the ground professional level rather than at a managerial level. And it was through that confidence in achieving good outcomes that the managers, I suppose, became reassured and stopped panicking mm. and became more supportive. I think the word case management was, was a terrible word to be adopted and because it, it was never intended that social workers managed people I mean, mm. the early work about case management was that it was relational and all those things you've mm. actually described, if you mm. go back to some of that very early literature. 
Um, mm. There's just a comment from William Crisp, who's one of our staff members, who's also a social worker, who says, weren't social workers doing co-production before it was called co-production? <laughs> uh, <laughs> whole other story there. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably true. Okay, we might stop for two or three minutes just to swap the slides and have a break. So if you're online, go and have a stand up, sit down, go to the loo, get a cup of tea, but you've only got about three minutes to do that and we'll be back again about two minutes past. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. So, Michelle, do you want to, David, do you want to get Michelle's slides sorted? I can't hear you. I'm on mute. <laughs> it's the chorus of our age. Um, let me just see if I can share my screen. Oh, I want to share. Let me just. So just make sure the PowerPoint open and then share. Yeah, I'm just um, going to. Oh, there we go. Desktop two. Share. Uh, Sorry, it's just going to. It's going to ask me for permission. Yeah, you should. just give, just give it a second. And my screen's around the uh, opposite way from how I normally have my screen, so I keep putting my mouse on the wrong side. <laughs> Here we go. Yes. Has that worked? It hasn't, no. Do you want me to? It often, it, you might, it doesn't necessarily work on two screens, this. It's like you need to get it up and then move it rather than trying to get it up on the second screen. Yeah, okay. It's coming through now. Let's have a look. Oh, okay. That's um, it. That, oh, see, that's my presenter's um, view. Well, it looks it looks good here. Except we can we've got this box in the. There you go. How's that? Yeah, but you need to go into presentation mode. Yeah, no, I am. It's showing you the wrong screen. Yeah, yeah. that's because you got two screens. Sorry. <laughs> you need to focus. You need to just put it all on one screen for the time being to get it up and then move it. Well. Do you want me to do your slides? Or David can do it, that might be easier. No, now I've lost everything, that's hilarious. Okay, just a sec, I'll just swap the screens around. It's thinking. That's still not working. Woman thing. All right, I'm just going to drag it onto my laptop. Then put it in slideshow. Has that worked? No. No, it's still in, in preview mode. Oh. Do you want? Way to do it. You can see my little cat typing. <laughs> yes, you might have to do it because for some reason this works perfectly well at home, but something about carrying my computer, oh, that's a bit of a pain. Okay. Hang on. So that that's fine now. Who's do, who's yeah? Doing? That's it's just not. It's not. I think it's um. Yeah, I just don't have it set up how I normally do at home. That's all right. I, um, you want to switch slides? Yeah, it's just a bit of a pain because I I do the quotes as separate. Um, and yeah, I'll just need to run my notes here too, so I can see what I was going to say. 
Yeah, so you can open yours, you can open the presentation on your screen <coughs> and you can see it. Yeah. And then everybody else can see yeah. David. I'm all good. Okay, all good? Yeah. Okay. All good. So, uh, welcome back everybody. It's three minutes past four. Um, the second presentation today comes from Michelle King, who is first and foremost, I'm not sure which one's first, but she's a parent of a young woman with a, a severe profound intellectual disability who I've met, who is delightful. Um, she brought her along to a presentation and they co-presented together. Um, but she is also a PhD student at Queensland University of Technology and is in the final throes of writing up her PhD thesis, uh, which is uh, about transition to adulthood, I think, and people with intellectual disabilities. Um, and she's also, her background is also in, in law. So she's a multi-talented person. Um, and it seemed appropriate to ask her from a parent perspective and from a parent researcher perspective to talk about the role that parents play almost as named social workers in a similar sort of role, um, which, which you've called sort of case managers, but I think we all know what, what you mean. So over to you. Um, and we'll look forward to hearing from you. So all yours. Please put your questions in the Q&A. Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks for asking me to speak. And yes, I'm, I have called these parents as case managers, which is not my um, preferred uh, term. But um, yeah, I think it's shorthand and often used in the literature. So we all know what I mean. Um, I'm kind of working on some other terminology, something around relational, um, whole life management, something like that. Anyway, so um, yes, thanks for asking me to, to, to talk um, briefly today about uh, one aspect of my doctoral research. Um, I might just, um, David's doing my slides for me because I am actually on a bit of a writer's retreat at Mooloola Bar at the moment. Um, I'm from Queensland, so we're very lucky not to have any restrictions. And um, in order to write my thesis, I have to remove myself from every <laughs> bit of life that attacks you at home. So I'm actually not at my usual workspace. So I'm going to get David to do, be my slide guy. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is just a little bit, um, people who've seen me speak before would have seen this slide. This is my little um, uh, visualization of my doctoral work. Um, I'm at the Australian Centre for Health Law Research, which is run through the QT School of Law. Um, my background is as a sociologist and lawyer. Um, and in other contexts, I've looked at how law works in practice. So I look at the social construction of law and its operation in real life. Um, and when it came to finally getting a PhD, um, I thought I would apply that to something that was quite obviously an issue who has intellectual and multiple disabilities. Um, uh, which was the year that she left school. So um, it's been a very interesting and demanding process. Going through it and also researching at the same time has been both a blessing and a curse as anyone who researches in areas where they personally have experience will know. So Michelle, my whole work looks at the Michelle, transition. Michelle, can I adulthood. just introduce you? We missed... You went off air for a tiny bit and we missed what you said about your daughter and what you oh, no. So can you just say that again? Okay. Sorry, I can't, I didn't get an indication. I was not um, yeah, I on here, but up. I am, you know. Okay. Um, uh, yes, so I, you mean the part, yeah, she has some profound intellectual multiple disabilities. She's um, got a condition called lysencephaly, which means her brain didn't form properly. Um, she's basically, she has no functional communication. She has some single words um, and is in a wheelchair and, and so forth. Um, she left school in 2016, which is when I um, 
started my PhD um, and really wanted to apply the things that I was interested in around how law works on the ground for people to how it works as people transition to adulthood. Um, so I guess this little graphic just kind of shows some of the conceptual work that I got down to. Um, I look in particular at uh, legal capacity and um, work on developing ideas about relational autonomy that can work for people who are unable to make decisions for themselves, for example, like my daughter. Um, so supported decision making is, is kind of not in the way that it's traditionally thought of is not necessarily an appropriate um, model for her to use. So one of the things I look at is, is how um, uh, difference is reflected in people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities, but I won't say too much about it. I'll move on to um, probably the next slide, if that's okay. So I look at adulthood in a legal sense um, because it's, that's why I have an elephant, it's hard to define, but you know it when you see it. And legally, of course, adulthood is defined in a number of ways, starting from about age 10, where you have some criminal responsibility um, through the various stages of healthcare decision-making, Medicare, where you um, are required to make decisions for yourself when interacting with government agencies like Centrelink. And then of course at 18, which is your traditional, I'm an adult. Um, and of course this is relevant to capacity because you are assumed to have legal capacity once you turn 18. So it's just a really useful site. And we all know transition to adulthood for people with any kind of disability through these systems is fraught, um, but it's also fraught in a legal sense. And it's a site where that really opens up how, where you can look at those issues with decision making and capacity and how they're reflected in people's lives. And that's certainly what happened in our life. Um, so I've just noted some of the core areas that um, legal and administrative kind of regulatory decision making comes out in people's lives. Um, so obviously finance and banking, um, the NDIS, contracting for services, so support work um, and allied health, um, housing accommodation, whether it's decision making about where someone lives or signing leases or other agreements as to services for accommodation. Um, of course, Centrelink um, and the disability support pension, which for people with PIMG starts at 16. Um, medical treatment, which is a whole other um, kettle of fish. Um, and, uh, you know, voting is kind of a placeholder for a whole bunch of other weird things that happen that you don't necessarily think that, that is an issue in transition, but that bumps up for people when you have someone who can't interact with these systems on their own behalf. Um, and that's my favorite cartoon, How to Adult. But yes, next slide, thank you. Um, that's a little graphic from the NDIS, which I think um, really represents all of these realms of support interacting. So one of the areas of literature that I use is this kind of intersection between capacity, legal capacity, and I guess life management realms of support. Um, oh, the, this should say, um, this should be another author as well. It's of course from, um, and I gave the citation in the slide that I have here, but I couldn't share it. So it's my, uh, Lana Kersner's, 2010 were the Canadian um, Law Commission that went through the realms of support. Um, and then Mary Donnelly um, discussed them in her 2019 paper about dementia. Um, apparently my internet connection is unstable. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's just breaking No, up. thumbs up. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Oh, sorry. All right. Um, again, sorry. <laughs> um, so these are kind of the realms that I think map nicely over the idea of as someone with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities who's lucky enough to have a parent or carer to navigate this process for them. Um, these are the domains in which that person is going to um, facilitate decision making and, and kind of actions for life. Um, and I think this maps over some of what uh, um, a named social worker might do, for example. So, you know, planning what someone's going to do um, and where they're going to live, um, 
how they're going to interact with systems, how they're going to get paid and receive services, um, and how their preferences are going to be um, expressed and advocated for and represented. Um, and really, I think this sums up what certainly in my experience and my research is what a lot of parent carers end up doing. And I guess in my work, I kind of call this whole life support. So it's, for example, my daughter is unable to express preferences um, other than you can tell when she doesn't um, like something or doesn't like to do something, but um, she is unable to communicate, for example, um, which bank she'd like to use or, or whether she'd like to use um, this service or that service or would she like to go to the movies today or ride on the ferry. She, you can't ask her. Um, you can do the activity and observe whether she prefers movies or ferries, but in the first instance, you can't ask. She's not able to, because of her brain malformation, she's not able to understand um, what her preferences might be. So when you're in a position of coordinating a whole life for somebody um, who is now an adult, it it's, um, extends into realms that perhaps uh, is not clear um, and obvious to people who haven't lived through that themselves. Um, next slide. And I do believe this one has a picture of my lovely daughter, Dale. Um, and that's because she uh, co-presented with me in um, at the ASA conference in 2019 about um, transition to adulthood. And uh, she also inadvertently assisted me doing some of my interviews because her support worker was sick a couple of times. So she came to a couple of interviews with me and um, is in my transcripts saying hello. Um, so I uh, interviewed uh, 18, well, I actually interviewed 20, but 18 participant pairs of uh, where a young adult aged between 17 and 30 um, had profound intellectual disability. And that was defined in certain ways, usually around whether they had functional communication and whether they required assistance with basically every activity of everyday life, um, whether they were able to express preference as to various legal and administrative decisions that had to be made. Um, so people self-selected, but also I tried where possible to do the interview both with the parent carer or the person who made their um, everyday decisions um, and the young person as well, um, which worked. Um, I had 13 interviews in pairs and five where the parent indicated to me that the young person was not able to participate, um, uh, usually because um, they had some issues with uh, reaction to a third person in their house. Um, so, of course, I couldn't substantiate that and inclusion is obviously an issue when you're working at this end of the intellectual disability spectrum. Um, I thought long and hard about how I could manage the issue of inclusion, and this was kind of the best I could come up with. And in 13 out of the 18 cases, it was a joint interview. I met the young person, they were present. I could kind of see for myself whether they were able to communicate in certain ways. Um, and that is why two of my participants out of the 20 interviews were ended up being excluded because the young person was able to make legal decisions for themselves. So they were verbal, they were able to use digital technology. So I kind of made the decision with my supervisors that we would exclude those two young people. It doesn't mean their, their, experience, their experience and their carer's experience is not relevant, of course it is, but because I was really focused at the non-problematic <laughs> end and anyone who works in capacity, I'm sure is nodding along, um, the non-problematic end of someone who needs to have their decisions expressed by another, uh, a supporter, so to speak. So um, I also kind of dug in a little bit toward ethnography because obviously I give my own experience and um, I'm actually working on a paper at the moment about how that affected the interviews, um, usually positively, but clearly it has a, an impact that I'm a member of the group. Um, 
usually that was positive because there was a lot of shared experience and shorthand that perhaps someone who didn't hadn't gone through those exact processes themselves in the same state in the same country would not necessarily have picked up but you know of course that is um, an issue so next slide um, oh you're going to have to bring up all my quotes sorry I hadn't fixed this. Just tap it. Sh you should click and they'll all come in. I'm fine for them all. I normally have them all work at once. I don't know why the slide is set up to do this. Okay. So I had a number of um, core themes around the idea of, um, and here I'm looking kind of more broadly. One of my one of my theoretical perspectives is around the idea of realities are different. So I look at the social slash medical model and some of the issues around that that I'm sure most people are familiar with. Um, and in particular, make an argument around the recognition of realities of impairment or difference for people at the profound um, uh, end of the scale of intellectual disability and that th these differences have real effects on their capacity to um, interact with the world and particularly inside um, legal decision making. Um, so I have some illustrations here, a couple of which were in um, a paper I published last year, which was just about the kind of everyday nature of how parents and young people bump up against this kind of um, how profound a difference it can be, which was something that I had experienced in my life with Dale and Dale had experienced, but it was really um, evident in all of the interviews I did that this was this was this kind of wanting people to understand how how different life was for these young people, um, particularly as they became adults where that difference becomes really obvious, I suppose. Um, and so many decisions need to be made and systems interacted with. So here we've got a couple of examples and I won't necessarily read them all out, but um, the, the classic um, from uh, the first one there, which is come and fill out the paperwork. Well, she can't read or write. You fill it out and she signs it. She can't hold a pencil. She has to make a mark. Well, she can't do that. She doesn't know what she's doing. Um, and then this was to do with, um, if it's my recollection serves me, to do with uh, banking, which was actually such a huge issue for people. I wrote a whole chapter on it. Um, so this kind of, well, they're going to make a mark on a piece of paper and that's going to somehow be <laughs> a legal decision by someone who doesn't know what a mark on a piece of paper is. For example, my daughter could make a mark on a piece of paper, but that doesn't really mean anything. So it's, it's this kind of de constantly dealing within these systems with people who really have no kind of capacity to understand the difference. So that's one aspect I just wanted to zoom through before I move on, if I could just go to the next slide and then you might have to click to bring up all the quotes to the core kind of thing relevant to this talk, which is that difference means that someone needs to manage your entire life. And if for everything from what you're wearing to where you're going to who you're working with to whether you do therapy, medical treatment, who you bank with, how you manage your money, dealing with NDIS and Centrelink so that you can have money to live and for you. Um, and uh, in many cases where a parent is willing and able to do it, this falls to parents as kind of a whole life manager. Um, and I've just got some example quotes here which really bring out that theme from the interviews that I did, which includes the title of this, this talk, which is I do it for nothing. Um, so there's this uh, theme, I guess, of this work being all encompassing demanding and almost completely invisible, um, let alone compensated or recognised within any, any of the current systems as they exist in Australia. Um, so a few examples of that is John, who, by the way, was the only man I interviewed, the rest were mothers, <laughs> um, is, you know, there's nowhere his daughter can stay overnight. Um, so we don't spend the money, we just keep her here. Um, Hetty says for her for her 19 year old son that there's an assumption it all gets done somehow and there's people like us doing it there's no recognition of how much time that takes or how difficult agencies make it. Um, 
Miranda, again, with a 19-year-old son, talks about how the NGA in this instance doesn't understand that a parent has to be on call, basically constantly. Um, and then Jane mentions that idea that I kind of alluded to earlier, that this is unrecognised labour. So caring for her now 23-year-old son 24 hours a day, um, and we had been talking about comparing that labour to the um, price guide released by the NDIS. The number of parents who mentioned how much they would get paid under the price guide was um, kind of a shared joke. Um, but there's no, and it wasn't so much they wanted to get paid, it was more that someone had put a number next to the labor, that labour, um, which is significant for people, I think. And it was a way for um, us to communicate that the work we were doing was worth this much money. So it's kind of a, if you're doing overnights, which is what my husband and I do for my daughter, she's turning 22 next month and she still lives with us at home. Um, there's an overnight rate for complex care one-on-one -on -one when you have to do active overnight, she has seizures. So you would wake normally between three and five times, which is one of the criteria in the guide. And therefore it's costed at a certain amount. And if you times that by 365, you go, well, it's worth a hundred and something thousand dollars, you know? So, and that's a really quite a powerful kind of way of going, well, you can turn to someone and go, well, are you doing that for your 22 year old? No, you're not. And it was a way of kind of reflecting not just the physical care, but, but also this administrative care um, where there was just gaps in, in how these decisions were being made, who was making them and who was coordinating them. That's just not filled in our current system. So probably the next slide quickly, not doing too bad. Oh, and load them up. Thank you. This is actually, um, I think there's a couple more. Yeah. Um, this is actually the, I put this in because this is the wheel that we got EIS last year. It only took two years of advocacy, um, $1,000. And um, anyway, it's great. I don't, I put a picture of Dale in it but we got it delivered last year about nine months ago and it's just a thing in the world. So I like to put a little picture of it to go, yes, whole life management, that was a win for me. Um, anyway, so again, this is kind of more on the idea that administration has to be done. It's not just the physical care or the medical care or having someone know exactly what the young person's disabilities are and how they're dealt with and who they see and how they get therapy and what their capacities are. It's the administration work. And this, of course, was the topic of most of my interviews. So there was this real feeling that this was totally invisible labour. Um, and it didn't fit within any of the kind of categories under what then was quite a new um, NDIS rollout. So I did most of my interviews in 2019 and people had only just gone on to the NDIS in Queensland then. Um, but it was a real kind of gap that was identified between, yes, you could have a support coordinator, um, but they weren't going to do um, this kind of whole life decision making and management. They might assist, um, for example, we have a support coordinator, but they might assist for if I say, I can you do you know of any speech therapists that deal with people who are nonverbal, um, and they might be able to source some for me. But in general, a support coordinator is not going to go. Um, I'm having issues managing my daughter's bank account because I can't get a, a swipe card, and the carer needs one. Can someone do that? Let alone be aware that this was a problem in the first place. So again, this was kind of just reflective of that total domain, life domain, um, referring back to the um, six areas of support that I had on an earlier slide. Um, and I really like the um, quote by um, Jade that, um, that you're doing the personal care, you're doing community access, you're doing overnights, you're paying the bills, you're managing NDIS, and you're still trying to do complicated legal stuff, for example, to do with banking, she was referring to there, um, and that there was no assistance for it unless you had money to pay a lawyer yourself. And even if you did, having been in the disability law field, it's quite difficult to find a lawyer who's going to understand the, what the issues are or be able to assist you. 
Um, oh, and then I'll just note that that last thing says Alison and Mary, but it says Harriet. It's not, Harriet is not her real name. It's just a pseudonym I used in a paper I wrote. So that's not a breach of confidentiality. I just changed all my pseudonyms for my actual thesis. So a bit of a mismatch there. Um, so this is a conversation between Harriet and I, and I guess it also indicates why it was useful to be a member of the group that I was interviewing. And this happened a lot, which was like, have you had similar to this? Was, you know, did this happen with your daughter? Um, how did you find that? And then I would usually kind of give a short, you know, they rang to ask about Dale's plan and asked me to put Dale on the phone. And that was kind of a way to open up more information about what that had meant to, to um, Harriet's experience of frustration about trying to deal with these administrative decisions um, and manage her daughter's whole life, I suppose. And her daughter had just turned 18. Um, okay, probably next slide. And I think I'm just about done. Oh, this is my um, little guy from Adventure Time. You can tell I also have a 12 year old um, who was very into Adventure Time a couple of years ago. So this is just a bit of a summary of some of the themes that I felt came out of this, which is firstly looking at people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities and really engaging with the, the real um, impacts of difference that this has in people's lives and in their supporters' lives. Um, that that has a real impact on every aspect of life that is not necessarily recognised um, or supported. And there's also, I'm sure all of us being from the disability um, field knows that there's also some kind of advocacy and theoretical issues around that as well. Um, but certainly my approach is to try to ground in the realities of difference having a real impact um, and that this bumps on to all types of decision making that need to be done as someone moves into adulthood. Um, I'm a real campaigner for a recognition of the idea of whole life management for people. Um, and this is almost completely invisible that some people need total support for all decisions that they're going to make. Um, and how do we do that in a way that is reflective of the principles of decision making um, that come through the CRPD and that involves support for decision making, but a recognition that in some instances that is a very complex and impossible thing to do. Um, and that this support continues throughout a person's life. It doesn't just, you don't just make a decision and that's it. Um, and I guess I flagged some difficulties, which is again, the theoretical idea that these issues are really hard to frame and discuss um, within the kind of current rhetoric around self-determination and supported decision-making. Um, and in that is in no way a critique of those things, which I am vehemently in favor of, but I also live in a real situation where those are basically ideals. They're not, they're not practical. Um, and, you know, I guess one of the things that my work, I hope, contributes as a way to fit that um, reality of difference within those very important recognitions of um, personhood and citizenship that more recent developments in theory have brought. Um, but it's worth flagging that that is still a big issue for people who are right over here on, um, I guess I have done other work where I call it the outliers. Um, when you're on, when you're on, when you're an outlier, it's difficult. Um, and of course, that there is no whole life planning slash case management. Um, there's no funding for it. If you're a parent, you're not going to get paid for it. Um, and that there are really no, um, because of the emphasis within the NDIS in particular, which is where most of the funding for these decisions comes from, um, it's very difficult to fit into um, into a person's plan, which of course means that if you're not lucky enough to have um, uh, someone who's, who has the capacity to assist a young person with that level of disability, that it's not really done. And of course, that is the, the big issue um, for people who don't have a parent or carer or other interested person in their lives to, to kind of advocate on their behalf. Um, of course, there's poor practices within and between systems um, 
that's kind of where the bulk of my PhD work is. No one talks to anyone and <laughs> there is no transporting these kind of things you've already determined that someone you know, can't make those decisions for themselves into other systems. You have to constantly do it over and over again. And I guess the final thing is who, who is responsible? Um, is there some way within the systems that we have of, of carving out a space for um, the needs of people who need this level of support? Um, yeah, so that's probably all I'm going to say. Um, of course, my work has a number of limitations, not least of which is I talked to parents who were interested enough to talk to me. Um, I'm not really able to get the views of the, the population that I'm interested in. Um, and I really have thought about that deeply. It's an issue I'm not sure there's a solution for. Um, and really I'm talking about a very specific group of people um, I don't mean any of this to apply to that everyone with an intellectual disability needs whole life management. That is not the perspective that I would um, portray, but I do think that there's space for that recognition that there are people like my daughter, she can't tell you if her leg is broken. So she needs someone to decide everything from the clothes she has to what she does with her life, to where she banks, to how her money is spent, to what her plan looks like. Um, and that she deserves to fit within these, this literature and within these ideas as well. So I guess that's kind of what my work is about. There's a bunch of stuff up there. Follow me on Twitter. I did a little blog for my project. Um, I don't update it very much, but it's been a really nice way to keep in touch with the participants. Um, so you're welcome to check that out. Most of it's about a year old now. Um, and yeah, that's probably me done. I hope I've covered everything I wanted to say. Mm, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That's really interesting. And I should say that there's a paper that Michelle contributed uh, about some of these issues in the latest issue of the Journal of Intellectual and Developmental Disability that has a whole section um, focused on, on the need to think about the realities of difference uh, around what we call dif de differentiation. So thank you, Michelle. There's a number of, of questions. There's one that I think Jacinta and I will come back to about supported decision making um, and and whether it whether it can potentially extend i mean i i think you 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 said your daughter can express preferences you know yeah. her that well she and you, she can express around certain things that's participation in decision making the oh very much I think often is that we have this normative idea that participation yeah. in decision making looks like somebody telling you and you're supporting them to tell you. It's actually much more complex than that, isn't it? Oh, very much. And it's, I'm sure you feel this way too. Whenever you kind of, you, it's almost like I want to put 10 minutes of disclaimers around the things that I talk about because decision making is very much at the center of my work. And Practically, it's not about, um, for example, I'll just talk from my own experience, it's not about my daughter not having preferences or contributing to, um, you, you know, her preferences and joys and needs contributing to what her life looks like. I mean, that's what we spend the majority of our time trying to, um, trying to implement um, with her. And she very much expresses, you know, things she likes to do, things she doesn't things she needs to do and things she doesn't, just like anyone um, in adulthood. It's, it's more, because I'm very much, I think probably the one disclaimer is because I'm very much from a legal background, legal capacity has very specific kind of definitions and applications within some of these systems when you transition to adulthood, for example, when you're trying to open a bank account for somebody or um, you're trying to access Centrelink or you're trying to employ staff. And in those situations, or you're trying to direct staff, for example, I employ three staff for my daughter. I was saying to David when I logged on, I spent the morning doing payroll before I did this, um, you know, uh, doing, did this talk because we're self-managing, um, but it's those kind of decisions and, and those are the decisions which I mean when I say my daughter cannot contribute. I mean, I could ask her, uh, there's no meaningful way in which she could express a preference for a key card or a, or a different kind of account or, or that she could, you know, um, say whether she wanted to vote. And look, voting is a whole other thing. I think everyone should be allowed to vote, but 
you know, it's, it's, it's where those ideals of support and, and self-determination and choice and control really rub up against living inside a legal, a legally regulated system that is fundamentally about autonomy and the people inside it having the power to consent and, and agree, which is the foundation of our legal system. And where that becomes interesting is the intersections, I suppose, which is why adulthood was such an interesting area to look at that. So, yeah, I guess that's a very long answer to go. I totally agree. <laughs> And that's very, the very reason why we need a, a good supported decision making scheme that both recognises the role of interpretation and, and involvement in expression of preferences, but also recognises those practicalities and gives supporters standing mm. in, in that without taking away the rights of the person yeah. themselves. Exactly. Uh, and I guess one of the me, things. Let me I'm... ask some other people. <laughs> Sorry. Go on. I was going to ask you some of the questions that are here before you answer. Yeah. So there's, there's a, a number of questions from somebody called Sue McDonald, who um, says she's the parent of a 19 year old son with profound disabilities. And she's found that the NDIA seem, see that you're able and willing to continue to support your child as they also refuse support coordination. I've become an NDIA support coordinator, which has been a major benefit. We're lucky to get 20 hours for the first time to assist with SDA, which is accommodation. Yeah. I'm now spending many hours setting up a therapy program for him so capacity building can occur. Um, yeah, do you want to comment on, on that? Look, I think um, I, have <laughs> I have probably lots to say about the NGIS, which by the way, has been an absolute godsend for us. Um, we get about 10 times as much funding as we used to get for Dale um, because of her level of need. Um, like I said, we now employ three staff. She has all types of therapy. She got a very expensive wheelchair. Um, in all of my interviews, I, I actually, um, I, I think this might've been in that paper you mentioned, Christina. It's like a, the NDIS is great, but, <laughs> and I think where some of those issues come from is from this idea that the NDIS is based around self-determination, choice and control, um, and then also some of its technical aspects because it's from an actuarial system and that it's also based on um, payment for delivered support. So it's based on, you know, hourly rates and that kind of thing. Is it's a real gap between um, what do you do when <laughs> you kind of have ongoing things. Um, how do you set goals that are, you know, some of Dale's goals are that she doesn't die. Um, there's this kind of, you know, you've got to set goals that we're working constantly towards something. And I'm like, well, our goal is that she just kind of stays alive and has great care. Um, so it's kind of this mismatch between those aspects um, that means that this kind of work is not necessarily recognised or getting done or getting paid for um, and you know that it's not without moving to a kind of block funded this is what everyone gets here's the list if you've got this disability you get x funding you don't want to move to that kind of model but also with an individualised model you do have gaps where some are getting support for things and others aren't for example we're self-managing and we do have support coordination hours. So there's this real, so why is that? Is that because I knew that they should provide them and I knew how to phrase it. Um, and if they didn't give it to me, I would go to appeal and I can represent myself because I'm legally qualified. I mean, that's, uh, how is that fair to someone who fronts up to the NDIA and says, well, my kid's quite disabled, but I don't really know what kind of services and supports I'm eligible for. Um, so I guess, do you see what I'm getting at there? There's a mix between uh, kind of procedural fairness and natural justice between similar cases and, and making sure that supports stay individualised. And I think that's something that's fairly well recognised in the literature around the NDIS that, that, um, that it perhaps needs a little bit more um, transparency around what can be funded, not what should be funded for that person, but 
you know, some guidelines for, you know, does your child have profound intellectual disabilities? Have you thought you might need wheelchair repair? Um, <laughs> where instead, you know, you get these stories of people not getting things funded um, like this. I'm not necessarily aware of specific advocacy organisations in Victoria, but because um, I'm in, based I mean, in don't, Brisbane. We'll, um, don't worry, I'll follow that, that one up. Yeah, um, um, so I'm, I'm not a great person to ask about that. I am, of course, happy to answer any questions on email. Um, I have a fair bit of NDIS experience, but that would be personal, you know, I can't really provide specific advice. Um, I, I, I think one of the important things to say is, you know, the role of a named social worker is a critical role, could potentially be a critical role for both people that, that don't have families at all to do any of that unpaid work, who are still living in group homes, for instance, that have nobody. And, you know, the comparison of what they might have gained from the NDIS, I suspect, is with some of the families is very, very stark and it's, yeah. it's often the people that we don't hear from at all that, that have the most need for this coordination yeah. as well as compensating parents for all the time and energy that they put in it's it's very complex um but i, I think, think there are a lot of people left behind where in in the system and that's beginning to show um but there's a question from damien damien is also a parent of somebody with a with a severe and profound intellectual disability and i should say that David has published a book chapter, which is coming out fairly soon, we hope, which was a set of interviews with a number of parents with children with adults who have severe and profound intellectual disabilities about their experience of the NDIS. So there's a lot of evidence sort of mounting up. But um, Damien says, has there been much discussion in the interviews that you've done about this requirement to set goals and, I think and they... the type of goals there are? Yeah, I touched on that before, and yes, there, there has. It's probably not something that I specifically teased out as yet because there's just so much. I mean, most of my interviews were approaching two hours long and uh, there's so much data and a PhD has a certain amount of <laughs> blinkers, but that is in my little list of things to look at later because it's something that personally, anecdotally, really bugged me. Um, because I don't like the idea that funding is based around achievement um, and that, you know, you, you get funding so that you can do this and then you tick it off and then, oh, you're cured. Um, and it, it was a real mismatch for, for someone whose object is to get their kid up through the day without dying. So, um, you know, that they're fed and, and if they have a seizure, they have an airway. And so there was a lot of kind of um, discussion around trying to fit that basic, um, have a goal that was this all encompassing survive and get good quality care and, and um, be well cared for as a goal. Um, and also on the flip side, that it was quite difficult to come up with, you know, they want you to have a kind of Back, this is a couple of years ago too. So they went and had long-term goals and short-term goals. And it was quite difficult to kind of go, oh, this is my short-term goal, you know. And for a lot of people, it was to get all the equipment that wasn't funded before. <laughs> um, so, you know, to get a new wheelchair and get an electric bed because they hadn't been previously funded in Queensland and, and to look at whether they could get a car modified and they needed a shower chair and the you know, you know, so it was a kind of the short term goals were catching up with the faults of the previous system as it had wound down in particular. Um, but other than that, it was it was like, what am I supposed to come up with some spurious, you know, um, and, and the goal system perhaps wasn't a good fit. So, yes, there was discussion about that. And I, I would like to write a paper on it eventually when I finish this darn thesis. So thank I, you, Damien. I think Dam Damien's done some writing around that I think one of the things he says is you know the golf his daughter he'd like to, to see as her that she's a valued person and uh, yes. you know, people value her and she values them and that's good enough why do we have to impose more uh, normative types of goals on people and I I don't like the whole thing that goals are connected to the idea that we would support someone to live that, uh, and to live a good life, like to live a life like anyone else, that 
that that has to be a goal. I mean, no one asks me what my goals are. Like, it, I'm, I'm, it's to live and have relationships and, and be visible in the world and to do activities. And I really felt a great level of resentment having to write that down in order to get funding so that someone can give my daughter one-on-one -on -one care or, or, yeah, anyway. <laughs> Big problem. Deep okay. breath. Deep breath. <laughs> Well, fundamentally, uh, Coral says, did the parents that you interviewed give you any uh, evidence about problems with medical consent issues? Um, that was something I asked about um, medical, um, the, in the sense of transitioning from the children's to the adult system, and also in the sense of, yeah, were there any added requirements that they'd experienced from the medical profession about consent? Um, so yeah, it was an aspect that I looked at. Um, reports were the transition, as we know, from children's to adults was, um, I won't swear, it was not good. <laughs> um, and that there was, th that people, particularly with older young adults, so I did interview a couple of people who whose young person was over 25, that, that the older a person got, the more likely they were to be asked about guardianship um, for medical decision making. Um, so I thought that was interesting, but I feel like I didn't really have enough numbers um, to, to say anything definitive about it, other than to flag that perhaps that's an issue in general as you're caring for a child who's moving past that initial stage of adulthood where perhaps the assumption is, sure, a parent can make decisions, I won't ask any questions. Um, to you know, someone in their 30s or 40s where a doctor might go, uh, are you the person who should be making these decisions or should we be getting some kind of formal um, approval, which again is its own area of kind of complex concern. Um, that real balance between protection, which is what a system comes at this kind of consent from, you know, making sure that someone's not being taken advantage of, um, in banking, that was a massive issue, no fraud and all that kind of thing, to, to recognising the right of someone to facilitate a supported decision to have a medical procedure done. It's a real balance. And when you're dealing with a system, that balance is just usually discarded in favour of give me a piece of paper and sign that. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Um, there's a couple of, of questions from, from um, Casey. Uh, She's asking about whether you have any good references or pointers uh, for the sort of the markers or the indicators of adulthood. Um, maybe well, they're on your slides or do you have a... I don't have a... I do have a slide on it. I actually gave a talk on that at um, the um, IASA conference in Glasgow because I find it fascinating because I'm from a sociological background. Um, I'm, I'm merely disguised as a lawyer. Um, so I... I find that idea of what our cultural norms of adulthood are really fascinating and I actually have a section in my theoretical work about it. Um, and one of the things I was interested in doing is seeing how those cultural norms were reflected in, um, in law, because usually that's just what law is, is codifications of various things we've all agreed are things. Um, so yes, there is a couple of, this. There's not a huge amount of work on it, but the actual idea that adulthood has these kind of markers and we know it when we see it, um, there, there is some good work on that. And of course, I'm totally spacing in front of the camera on who those people are, but I could certainly dig up some papers for you um, because I think that's really interesting and how that inter intersects with lived experience and, and the legal aspects. Um, and certainly at the root of most of it is this idea of independence and autonomy. So we, we have a very, um, we have a very individualized system. So I, I did use a lot of that individualization literature that our society pushes us to be, you're an autonomous individual and there's no room for relational autonomy. Um, and that's really tied to the acquisition of adulthood. Um, to be independent, alone, <laughs> a rock in the ocean, um, 
and I guess one of my arguments in, in, in my work overall is that relational autonomy is one of the solutions to approaching this idea of supported decision making and being able to interact in legal legalistic ways with various institutions um, to more formally recognise that we all live in relationships and and that it's okay for those relationships to authorise, I suppose, for example, financial decision making, bank accounts, signing forms, that kind of thing, and that we really should move away from this, no, only you can do it and yeah, you're alone in the wilderness. So I guess... Some people, some people with intellectual disabilities are. Um, they are. So we have yeah. to find and support people yes. to have those relationships sometimes. Exactly. Um, to, uh, there's a, there was a person, somebody who was doing a PhD in South Australia who was looking at this whole issue about markers of adulthood. And there's a paper, if you look back in, the, in RAPID, uh, which is one of the journals that ACID produces, um, there is a paper from her around that issue um, but there are some really good solid literature from a good few years yeah. ago about those sorts of markers so maybe I can I'll pass you on the contact or the person can contact you um, yeah I'm just thinking too I read a great oh, paper oh, oh, here it is Harry Blatterer had a paper called contemporary adulthood reconceptualizing an uncontested category from Macquarie University it was in current sociology a few years ago, 2007. And that was a really good um, introduction to the idea of adulthood as a social construct. So. Okay, should... so whoever it was, uh, Casey, you could get in touch with Michelle and she'll give you that reference. There's, um, there's a question from Jan who says, I have a daughter with Down syndrome who wishes to live in a different country, Australia, uh, from the rest of her family. So presumably Jan somewhere else. I definitely need a case manager to help her manage her life. Do you think trying to hire a retired social worker would be a good idea for this? Also, we are self-managed and six months ago, I hired a bookkeeper who processes and pays all the NDIS invoices. She's amazing and it saved me so much time. I'm, I always say that to our staff who are awesome is, um, is that I should use my charge out rate for doing the bookkeeping, <laughs> but I don't. But yes, I know there are ways that you can farm out some of this work. And I guess that's part of what I find interesting is that you can pay someone else to do it. Um, and I find that dichotomy really fascinating, this real reluctance to, to tie the work that parents or other family members or supporters, friends are doing to money. We've got a real um, reluctance to do it, particularly in Australia, I think. Um, it's almost forbidden to men mention the fact that you could get paid to do some of this work, even though I could get funded to pay someone else. It's not even like, well, my daughter requires this work. Here's the block of funding that should go towards it. You can pay yourself or you could pay someone else. It's, you can't pay yourself. So I think that's fascinating. But yeah, I think more flexible approaches, like I love the idea of hiring someone to help like a social worker to do some of this to kind of go I'm going to find someone if you're self-managed and you can justify it as satisfying one of their goals um, to live a good quality life then I personally don't see why you couldn't pay somebody to to assist with some of this like operational decision making in particular um, it's just not something it, it's a you know ad hoc thing it's not something that's kind of written down as people needing um, particularly people transitioning to adulthood where a lot of these decisions are being made. Where are they going to, where are you going to live? What are you going to do with your time? Are you, do you need 24 hour support work? You know, which therapists are you going to use? Do you have a bank card? You know, it's, it's this kind of, let's just all admit that this is stuff that needs to be done and try and come up with some fair way to do it, a way that allows people with perhaps less social capital and less relationship to also access supports that are going to enable them to do it. So I guess that's the end of my rant. Okay, that's great. We're nearly out of time. I would just say I'd get a social worker that's young and keen and got lots of energy rather than somebody who's retired, um, yeah. <laughs> who will be also younger people will be more up to date. And it's a, there's an age thing about working with young adults. I think that's really important too, <laughs> you know, as a parent, I'm, continually told I've got no idea about what's going on 
for young people. So anyway, um, thank you very much to both our speakers. Lynn, it was really great to host you and to see a perspective from elsewhere and Michelle to hear the next instalment about your work and we look forward to more of it being published. The, the, the slides will be available on our website. We will edit and get permission from the speakers uh, for the recording and that will be up there too in due course. Um, the next seminar takes a fairly different uh, tack. So it's going to be focused around physical activity uh, for people, young people with intellectual disabilities and specific syndromes. So uh, Rett syndrome and uh, Prader-Willi syndrome and people with Down syndrome too, I think. So it, it's drawing on the work of uh, Jenny Downs from the Telethon Institute for Kids in Perth and Nora Shields, who's a professor of physiotherapy here at La Trobe and has been working in this area for quite some time. So they're going to present some of their work and then two of their PhD students who are working on current studies, Cara Schofield and Georgia McKenzie, will present the, some of their uh, findings or their protocols for the work that they're doing. So we'll have sort of four speakers uh, talking about different aspects of, of research on physical activity for young people with intellectual disabilities. And that will be on the second Wednesday in March, which is the 10th of March at three o'clock. So thank you everybody for coming. Thanks once again to our presenters. Uh, please email us, you've all got the email um, if you want to uh, be in touch or if you want to be in touch with either Michelle or Lynn and we can pass those things on, on with you. Okay, thank you very much and good afternoon. See you next time.